Our first speaker today is A.D. Tomer. He is a fellow at the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program and leads the Metropolitan Infrastructure Initiative. He's the go-to guy if you want to understand what's going on in infrastructure on the Hill and over time. He, and so I've asked him to come give a big picture overview of infrastructure spending, the, the, you know, how it's changed over time, what the new bill looks like, and what the country's infrastructure system looks like. So we're going to have him for the next hour. Um, AD is going to have a, a presentation, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So AD, I want to welcome you and turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Chris. And, and thanks for having me. And, and great to uh, to meet all of you this, this morning. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else stayed up and watched the United States-Mexico match last night, but if I sound groggy, that's exactly what you're hearing here. Because um, even though I study infrastructure, I'm still a human and uh, not totally boring, hopefully, all the time. Uh, it, I, I couldn't agree with Chris Moore. This is, um, I'm gonna speak extra candid today. I mean, I kind of always do. Uh, I grew up in Florida, so there's kind of no other way of speaking uh, where I grew up. But uh, the infrastructure is traditionally something that is really hard to get folks excited about. Um, and which is kind of ironic, because if you think about it, um, the policy topics, and that's not everything, of course, in the media, but especially in DC circles, right? We all kind of tend to touch policy on some level. If you think about it, it's actually the policy that we kind of touches us, not just every day, but all throughout the day. Um, and so in a weird way, it, it's kind of this, this flip, right? Like we're, you know, right, I worked at Brookings Institution. If you've heard of us before, you probably know us because we're one of, if not the premier kind of like foreign policy shop in the country, right? Well, like how often does foreign policy really touch your daily life, right? You know, there's but yet, in some ways, the stories are easier to tell through that perspective. Um, hopefully, what I kind of walk through today gives you a kind of uh, maybe a slightly different appreciation for infrastructure. Um, puts obviously the uh, the current debate in perspective uh, that's happening in Washington. And then I wanted to leave you with some kind of high level questions too uh, that that I'm going through before I start sharing my screen. I want to make sure I kind of put out some really uh, a quick setup on how I want this to flow today. If you all have questions, I may not be able to see it, but Chris or someone else, or you can just can jump in, but just to say, hey, stop, I, I wanna ask you something like that. That's totally fine. Um, you know, this is all effectively planned extemporaneous speaking. So there's no problem for jumping in and, and hitting a discussion point. Um, I'd be happy to do it. And of course I'll stop about halfway through our, our period here, just period, I'll be done. And then <laughs> happy to get into discussion points with you all too. Um, I've been working with the media for 15 years now on the job um, and working collaboratively with, collaboratively with them on figuring out different ways to tell these infrastructure stories that we know matter, but can be hard to do. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious to do that with you all today. Um, so let me share my screen and I'll do that classic Zoom thing. Can someone give me like a thumbs up or anything? You got this? Yep, we have you. Good. Looks awesome. good. Um, so Overall, before I kind of start clicking through everything here, I want to lay out kind of three high level points just to, to put in your head. Number one, infrastructure is, is just really, really complicated, uh, which is I think part of the reason it's hard to tell stories here. These systems are incredibly complex. I don't know about the rest of you. I did, I took physics in high school and didn't want to go any further with it. Same thing for calculus. The folks who really manage these systems, they are have a deep level of scientific expertise. And to make it even harder, and part of the reason you see this picture, this is Portland, Oregon, by the way, um, that's a freight railroad. That's like, if you will, the I-5 of which, for those who know the West Coast, that's, you know, like that's their 95, right, for the East Coast. So that's the main highway up and down the coast. This is the I-5, if you will, of freight rail. That is no doubt going through, it's not downtown Portland, but it's right over uh, uh, the Willamette on the other side of um, uh, of the of downtown, you can kind of actually see the bridge on the upper left, that's where that's going. You can see a car that's going over it. In fact, bikers, like, and I mean bikes like like a like regular bike, not motorcycle, but them too. They can be stopped here for an hour because the freight rail line actually goes right through the city um, as these incredibly multi-mile long trains roll through Portland. Um, and the reason, A, I, I just kind of like the picture in general, but it's to tell you how these systems interconnect. And that's part of the reason they're so complex. None of these infrastructure systems work in isolation. 
If you look on the screen too, it's probably, you probably overlooked it. The power lines are right there. By the way, that's also telephone lines. It's probably also cable communications too. So everything that makes daily life possible, you can actually see, uh, you can't see what I'm pointing at, but there is in fact a wireless cell phone tower to the right side of the tracks, about three buildings in from the bottom too. So everything that makes your daily life possible is actually in this, in this, uh, in this picture. And probably most of us were just looking at the framing aesthetics of the whole thing. That's certainly where my head starts, right? So um, it's kind of hidden in plain sight all the time. So because these systems are so complex and interwoven, it's really hard to tell those stories. But third, and hopefully to leave you with something positive, is there is an endless well of infrastructure stories to tell. The secret is figuring out how do you get an inroad to making something resonate with folks that touches on the part that matters to them, which is not just their daily lives, but I'll talk about it a little bit in the presentation today, but oftentimes what the absence of infrastructure looks like and why that's so important to make sure we keep things going. Um, what is infrastructure? Right. This is one of like the first things that goes through people's minds. If you've been following the DC debate over the past, uh, really since about February or so, you know, March, once the American Jobs Plan came out officially in March, there's been this actual debate over definition. Um, conservatively, we define infrastructure through four major capital systems. So that you're seeing them on the screen here. That's transportation, um, which comes in all kinds of flavors. Right. This is a picture of New York, but um, so you're getting, you know. Bikes, pedestrians, drivers, freight all on it at once. It also includes, of course, surface transportation, airports, et cetera. Um, water resources, which is drinking water, storm water, um, natural water resources, right? They all fall under it here. Um, energy, you can see in the bottom corner. And, and you know, that's both not just the energy generation, um, which of course can be electricity, but also natural gas and things, but also the what's called transmission and distribution. That's the like, you know. That's the power lines, right? That's getting it from the power plant to your home or business. And then increasingly, we are recognizing that telecommunications is also part of infrastructure. Traditionally, right, that's telephone service. Um, radio um, has become uh, obviously really defined in modern times by television and even less so that and even becoming more so broadband, of course. These four sectors, just their physical assets, not even the equipment, is conservatively valued at $14 trillion. It's a lot of loot. Um, these, to be clear, that's approaching, I mean, it's not there, but it's, you know, you're like in three quarters percent way there. Annual GDP in the US, right? So every, all goods and services, everything we do, just the infrastructure we have on the ground right now is almost worth three quarters of that. It is just massive. And that does not include the IP, which is in some ways could be even more valuable, right? Uh, and a whole bunch of other resources. One of the ones that we try to focus on, which we think is important for storytelling too, is infrastructure is also about the people, which of course is, sounds hokey, but it's more than that. It's, you know, it's the workforce that helps put together um, these projects. It's the inventors who help um, create new innovative services and goods that change our daily lives. And of course, it's also people that work in, let's say, conservation to protect our natural world. So infrastructure is as much about the people as it is about the projects too. And if you wanna kind of see what infrastructure looks at the macro scale, not necessarily through that Portland lens, I mean, here it is, right? A genuine satellite picture of the United States typified by the lights and the roads and the telecommunications that connect us all. Um, you know, th this, this is it, right? Um, so it's a omnipresent part of our lives. I'm a, a, I love history as a, as a background it, that doesn't matter. I'm a history major from undergrad. So I, I, I think it's an important way we always tell our stories for context. Um, this is what our cities look like not more than 100 years ago, let's call it at the turn of the last century, right? So late 1800s into the early 1900s. You've got in the top left, um, local city streets that are completely um, unregulated, um, which by the way, I kind of liked to be clear, so I'm not critiquing that, but look at, I mean, the amount of different modes of transportation you see all at once. And it, critically, 
the amount of street vendors and what's happening on the sidewalks. And to be clear, this is not just something that was happening in places like New York. It was also places like St. Louis and Cleveland and Buffalo and Milwaukee. This is just what our, our city streets look like in the United States. Deeply ungoverned, critically here, right? You do not see for the most part an actual um, uh, gas or electric powered automobile, right? So they are not, they are invented, but they're not really yet here in mass. Um, the, um, on the top right, you've got water resources. So interestingly, we were already building out our drinking and sewer water systems at that time. So this is actually a picture from, uh, from Seattle um, where they were building a massive uh, sewer pipe um, to change um, how that city was managed. In the bottom right, yes, we were still operating almost entirely on gas, uh, um, gas powered light. Um, so this, there was, this is actually someone with a connection most likely into the wall, right? To make sure that that gas powered um, uh, light could be on ideally as often as possible, but not yet by electricity. And in the bottom left, this is actually not from the United States. This is from Stockholm, Sweden. Those are all telephone lines. And so you can see all the different connections that people had to have to be able to get routed. Of course, you know, there's no picture here of an operator terminal, but that was happening too. So think about in just a hundred plus years, what our cities look like now, right? You know, these highways that you see, you know, I, I think we not take them for granted, but you know, I don't know about like y'all, you know, when, when I drive around, I don't like think about these, like the majesty of the overpass. I just hope there's no traffic, right? Um, when I do it. But when we focus on what they are and compare it to where we came from, um, it is really incredible in the story of human history to within a century or so to have this kind of infrastructure take over from city streets. And of course, I'll talk a little bit more throughout the theme, uh, throughout the presentation today, how, how big a deal this is and how many problems we've run into because of this commitment. In the top right, there's actually a picture from DC, which you maybe can see from the logo. They are building a massive multi-billion dollar water, uh, basically like storage facility under the city uh, to reduce overflow into the Anacostia River. So this is the massive dredging machine. Um, I don't know if Chris or others remember the name. I, I don't think her name's Big Bertha, but there's a different water uh, <laughs> tunneling machine that's called Big Bertha elsewhere in the US. Um, the that this is doing like no justice to how big this this uh this machine is multiple of us would like be standing on top of each other circus style to be the height of this thing um and that again that's getting dug right now like i mean right now under washington dc to try to reduce flooding um and the storm water of course in the bottom right this picture of chicago but more so i want you to focus on look at all those lights <laughs> like and I don't think we should undersell that like our great grandparents, people you probably have a picture of, if not in your house, but like your folks or your grandparents did, right? They, they could not imagine a city like this. Like they didn't potentially never even saw it depending on how long they lived, right? And it's just no big thing, right? We walk through the cities at night, just assuming there'll be lights everywhere, right? Game changing. And of course for telecommunications, there, there's, no, there's no necessarily wires anymore, right? Um, obviously, we live off wireless tech. So these are dramatic changes in a relatively short period of time. And I want to like show you how these actually play out in Washington, D.C. You all probably either have been working in Washington or living in Washington for some time or, or at least, you know, remotely kind of studying it. So you can kind of see where um, where the mall is kind of somewhat near the top, the Capitol building. You can kind of see um, where the ellipse is in, in Washington, D.C. These are just talking about changes into the inner core of Washington. This is areas that were likely mostly developed at, at around the 1900s, although not, not all of it. And in fact, if you can see in the bottom right, if you've got those patterns that look like subdivisions and uh, suburban sprawl, then chances are those are brand new developments in the last 100 years, right? So um, we've obviously tried to clean up the river significantly. Um, we've changed our power plants in the in the region, we actually shut down a major coal fired plant that, for environmental justice reasons, was actually uh, harming people who live near it, and they were people of color. Um, we've seen 
highways actually rammed through the region, also an issue of environmental in, uh, injustice. Um, and to be clear on where they're pointing to, I, I want to stress, there were neighborhoods there, right? People's houses were torn down by eminent domain. They did not ask them to be. You've seen a lot of conversation around this. In fact, just last week, um, not to compare uh, to what happened, the initial event in Tulsa, but a highway was later rammed through what was formerly Black Wall Street, right? Uh, so that kind of practice has been done all over the place. Ironically, if you see that kind of where I'm pointing to experiments in new mobility and digitalization, which I could kind of point to most of central Washington. Um, at the same time we've rammed through these highways, we're also starting to now, and that was done obviously a few decades ago, we're now starting to experiment with different kinds of um, scooters and bike lanes. And I know all that stuff is kind of, you know, easy hipster jokes and, and they're good ones. Um, but it also is a transformative way for how we can travel through regions for those of us who spent time in Washington before those bike lanes were there, you really were taking your life in your hands when you biked around the city. Um, the protective bike lanes on places like 15th Street um, and elsewhere on M Street, I mean, they changed the way you travel around the city, right? And if especially if you can get on an e-bike during these warm months, you might not even get be sweaty by the time you get to your, your next meeting. Um, finally, you know, DCA, which you can kind of see, and you can see just how big it is um, compared to the city, um, that is actually one of the oldest kind of central commercial airports in the country. I would love to obviously have pointed out Dulles, but we would have lost all fidelity here. But the point is like, you know, a hundred plus years ago, think about how hard it would have been to get from DC to certainly across the country, if not to other continents, right? It would have been multiple, um, multiple days, if not more, to let's say get to places like Los Angeles or Seattle. Now you can walk right into DCA and get a direct flight to Seattle, you, you'll be there in four or five hours. I mean, it, it's an, it's it's truly transformative, right? And especially for the folks who, who who represent other parts of the country, I mean, DC just couldn't function the same way. So again, these are these are just in our backyard changes that we've seen. And and so when I, you know, you kind of all probably know this colloquial history, but the reason I bring it back up is it really is touching you every single day. So if our infrastructure is worth just a monster load of money. Um, if there are so many other components of it, um, but we built out so much, um, the question is what, what's gonna happen kind of going forward? What are the big issues that are facing infrastructure systems? These are macro in scale. Um, we put out a, a really big report um, uh, called Rebuild with Purpose recently. These are the same, I'm not recommending reading it unless you're having trouble falling asleep, but these are the same four kind of headers for them. So I want to, rather than just do this kind of, okay, we're all on the same page here, kind of light touch history lesson, let's get into like where we are now, because that's going to set our path going forward. So on, in terms of climate, uh, climate issues, um, we obviously know that these acute costly disasters are becoming more common. You've seen these in, in the news, probably many of you live or grew up um, in areas that have been hit by these. Again, I mentioned I'm from Florida. I grew up with Hurricane Andrew, for those who are even know that one by name, which is a massive storm that just wrecked um, parts of uh, greater Miami. In fact, it is one of the biggest disasters in that 1990s colony, you can see. But check what's going on here, right? I mean, our storms just continue to grow fiercer, more frequent, and critically, we continue to pay more in damage here for them. Now, the, let me kind of give you one example here that really matters. It's not in this presentation. Um, you all are obviously are familiar with the Texas freeze that happened um, just this past winter. Um, one of the highway expansions that took place in Texas, and they've had a ton of them, was something called the Katy Freeway expansion. Katy is a, another town um, that's really part of metropolitan Houston. It's directly west of Houston. And the um, I-10 expansion to connect Katy to Houston, they wanted to widen it. So it went from, this is not hyperbole, from eight lanes to 23 lanes on each side. So it's a lot of concrete. And that cost $2.8 billion. It's a lot of money. To weatherize all of Texas, not just the Houston area, all of Texas would have cost $400 million. And that spending was done in a very similar um, kind of time period. So put that in perspective, we lost over now over 100 people. The damage 
was many times the magnitude of the spending on the Katy Freeway expansion. And by the way, the day the Katy Freeway expansion opened up, it was immediately congested with traffic again. So our outcomes, our goals are completely misaligned when it comes to environmental issues. And this chart is one of the ways to think about it. We have got to figure out how to manage these disasters. But of course, even if we kind of cover those chronic, um, or excuse me, the acute challenges, it's the chronic ones that often are really leaving us um, with uh, ever present kind of feeling of, of issue and challenge from changing climate. So you've got in some places flooding and too much water. Um, in some places you've got perennial drought and way too little water. This is a huge issue in the inner mountain west, which is actually one of the fastest growing populated parts of the country. Then we have issues like urban heat islands, let's say, like, and not just in our you know, um, markets, let's say like Los Angeles that I think of, you know, kind of get associated in many people's minds colloquially with smog. There was an amazing story that Brad Plumer did in the New York Times that maybe some of you saw using academic research showing the urban heat island effect in Richmond, Virginia, um, and how that impacted quality of life, again, in particular, for people of color and lower incomes uh, that lived in the areas where the urban heat island effect was largest. So we have got to figure out how to get our climate under control for us. So that's both mitigating the worst impacts, but also adapting to a changing, changing climate too. Second part, the digitalization. So if we've done so much building out of our network when it comes to uh, surface transportation, aviation, effectively every corner of the country um, has uh, a water connection, especially for drinking and wastewater. You know, broadband is truly a central infrastructure. We've all learned this during the pandemic. I don't mean to state the obvious, of course, but we are <laughs> a certain same room effectively right now. We're still meeting. It's pretty incredible. Um, but that network does not go everywhere. Um, this is a picture of uh, Metropolitan St. Louis, and you can see the city's boundaries in red there. Um, there are huge gaps by who, where networks go, irrespective of where the networks are, who subscribes to them, and then who actually has the skills to use the internet. So which, that's the kind of trifecta that we call digital equity. And we are nowhere near the connection levels um, that we need. There are approximately 17 million households in the United States um, are disconnected or do not have a broadband subscription, which if, if that was drinking water or energy, let's say, um, it would be the most important project we could conduct in the entire country. Um, but we're not treating broadband like that just yet, although I think more of that is coming. Um, of course, we know too that there's so much upside if we can get folks on. This is just showing you the share of e-commerce sales. Um, uh, oh, sorry, total retail that e-commerce is now um, uh, is going through e-commerce. So you're talking about, you can see it's a steadily rising curve. Um, we hit unbelievable levels during, um, this is annualized too, so meaning adding up four straight quarters. So we hit unbelievable rates during um, the beginning of the pandemic, but still those rates are holding up and it feels like the uh, COVID was an accelerant. But it's not just e-commerce, right? It's the use of artificial intelligence in our daily lives. It's how we digitalize our built environment that I'll talk a little bit more later. So um, again, if we can get everyone connected, we tend to think of uh, the digital um, kind of evolution, digital revolution, whatever you want to call it, as an incredible opportunity to change people's quality of life. Third is the work we do um, to build and maintain um, and even design all of this infrastructure. So the nature of that work is changing. Um, you're gonna hear a lot about um, what infrastructure is as a job still. Um, to put in perspective, um, over 10% of the US workforce works in uh, infrastructure occupations. So that's everything from, again, engineers who do design work, of course, construction, but also truck drivers. People work inside manufacturing facilities that actually just focus on these infrastructure components. It's a huge part of our workforce. Um, more people than work in manufacturing, right? So thinking about the nature of that work really matters. And there's a huge amount of growth um, and opportunities in it. The problem is we have kind of a trifecta here of older workers. It's overly white and really bad, it, way overly male. Um, 
And so we need to get younger, more diverse, in particular women or female workers into the infrastructure occupations to make sure we can continue to have a competitive infrastructure ecosystem in the US. Finally, we talk about this is, and I want to stress, this is probably the most boring part of the whole thing, at least for me even. <laughs> uh, but think about how we pay for infrastructure really, really matters. And how we pay for infrastructure also matters who's doing the paying and what are the sources for it. So this chart, if you haven't probably seen it before, is doing a lot of things at once. But I want to stress, think about the difference between operation and maintenance. That's just making sure, right, that you're getting rid of potholes on roads, um, that there aren't water pipe leaks. And this is specifically focused on transportation and water infrastructure because it's what's publicly owned. Um, you can see that building new things, which is the capital lines, they're not going up, they're actually going down. And in fact, it's actually state and local government that continues to have to pay more and more to maintain our infrastructure assets. This is why there's a huge conversation happening that I'll get to in one second on what is the federal role in investing in infrastructure and how do we start to making really wise generational capital investments that are being crowded out right now by all the maintenance needs. Now, finally, there's another angle to this too that we're really passionate about, which is this idea of is the built environment affordable for everyone? And what this is doing is showing you the quintiles of Americans by household income. So that's the lowest 20% of earning households, then the second 20%, et cetera. And it's stacking up the amount of their income they pay in utilities, broadly defined, transportation, and housing. What you can see is that the lowest quintile of Americans, right? This is tens of millions of households are actually in the red every single month, just when you combine utilities, transportation, and housing. And the second 20% of households after them, so that's, we're talking 40% in total, are really close to broke just by the built environment alone. So we've got to think about not just how we pay for infrastructure, but how can we make infrastructure affordable for people. And then if you want to define it even larger, as you can see by the, the extent of the, each, uh, each um, category in the bar chart, we want to make housing more affordable too, which is a whole separate conversation. So that takes us to the conversation today of what's happening in Washington. And I'm sure you all have heard about the American Jobs Plan. It's been kind of, uh, as, as I've been saying to folks, the White House has clearly won the, the new cycle, if nothing else in the sense to get it to be a major topic of conversation. Effectively every day in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you can find infrastructure above the digital fold. Um, and that's a huge game changer. I think Chris kind of alluded to that in his intro. Um, normally infrastructure is kind of on the proverbial, you know, not even back pages, that almost makes it sound good. It's you know, buried somewhere else. Um, but they, again, the White House has really succeeded to make us, force us to talk about it. Um, and what the Democrats are proposing, and I'll get to the, the other side here in a second, but is that they're touching on all those major components of infrastructure. So it's not just the four big capital sectors, as you can kind of see in the third bullet there, it's workforce programs, it's R&D. It's how we actually invest in, in real estate in terms of weatherization and other elements. There's also a very deep commitment to responding to the climate moment. Um, and what they wanna do is infuse as much funding as possible into state and local governments in particular to make investments in necessary infrastructure, whether it's the transportation and water they own, helping the uh, state and local governments build out broadband infrastructure for where private sector has not gone. Um, so that's both a rural and an urban neighborhood issue. But then fourth is actually working with um, private energy companies to rebuild our grid um, or other components of, uh, of the transmission and distribution system. So how does that all kind of add up? This is truly a transformative and a historic um, investment in infrastructure. This chart is showing you what is the share of our actual infrastructure spending in blue as, um, as a share of GDP, right? It's the best way we can look at historical comparisons. And those two red lines, what they're basically showing you is what we spent in the New Deal. So the biggest New Deal year in terms of infrastructure was in 1933. You can see we almost hit 3% of GDP. Our average, though, over four years was actually a more reasonable one of 1.3%. We're clearly below that right now, but you can see what we've done is give you an example of if you spent extra money,
per year. We actually did this during the Trump administration uh, to kind of show when they talked about, right, we want to invest uh, $2 trillion in infrastructure. We were like, well, let's actually see what it would take to, to reach new deal levels. You can see that it really would require $400 billion each year if we wanted to sustain new deal level. But even if we hit $200 billion or $100 billion extra each year, um, we're going to be at the kind of new deal level investment. That is exactly what Biden and the, um, the American, the Biden administration, the American Jobs Plan, and even the Democrats on both chambers of, the, of Congress are proposing. So this is in fact a historic investment in infrastructure. Problem is they may not get their way, right? So, oh good, Chris. Yeah, Eddie, could I ask a question? Go back to that last slide, yeah. Chris. Um, so the, uh, can, Sorry, you, can you go back to the last screen. slide? Yeah, my computer just froze. <laughs> oh, okay. Go ahead and ask your question though. I can hear you. Okay. So the so you say the green line was Whoa. okay. The green line was that is the um, the Biden plan. It would jump to that level. The Biden plan wants to do 2.3 trillion over 10 years. Actually, it's 15 years. So they really kind of are between that those two green lines. So they are historic. We actually did this chart. I just repurposed this. This took us like a month or so of like re original research to make even. So think back to the, the Trump plan. This was just showing different levels of investment. But the, the concept is the same, right? Which is if you increase it by each by that amount each year, this time it said starting in 2018, it wouldn't matter if that was 2022. Um, these are the levels of GDP you'd be at, right? With current baseline spending too. So it's actually adding 400 billion or 200 billion or 100 billion each year. Um, so you can see even at the $100 billion level, you get close to the kind of average New Deal spending, if you will. Okay. And finally, the back in the New Deal era, uh, their infrastructure spending at the time, was it I mean, what was it? Was it primarily roads programs, TVA? What were they doing back then? Oh my gosh, it was all over the place. Yeah. So for folks who have kind of you know loosely read about this, this is the Works Progress Administration in particular, which didn't uh, obviously doesn't exist anymore. But actually, it predates right the Department of Transportation, Housing and Urban Development. There was no EPA. So what they did was they were building roads and bridges. They were building all the sectors. They were helping to fund rural electrification and rural telephone service. And I can get back to that if you all want at some point, especially maybe in Q&A about the corollaries between almost 100 years later to the year, um, rural electrification relative to rural broadbandification, if that's a word. <laughs> um, so they're doing that. They were doing, um, uh, so that's energy and telecom. They were also, um, they were also in massive energy investments like the Hoover Dam. Um, there are also huge community investments. So if there are anyone who's, who's spent time in San, San Antonio, the Riverwalk, oddly enough, is a New Deal project. Um, there is a really famous theater in, um, I believe it's in Charleston, South Carolina, that was built with New Deal money. Like, they were doing all kinds of zany stuff um, that, again, a lot of it has actually stood the test of time, too. Um, but the key there was a combination, right, of, of course, putting people to work but also kind of testing out new ideas too. So it really was a mix of traditional infrastructure with some experiment, uh, some serious experimentation, significant amounts of R&D, everything that the Biden um, administration is effectively proposing now, just you know, fast forward hundred years in terms of technological development and, and a different kind of economic moment. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. So. Um, and again, everyone should just jump in, like Chris said, I can kind of hear the um, hear you jump in. So um, I've got probably like six or seven more slides left, though. Um, the, so obviously, the Republicans do not see uh, the infrastructure need in the same way. But this is key. There is a bipartisan interest in investing in infrastructure. That, that, that is a true part of the story. And, and of course, you're here reading a lot about Democrats being frustrated with this process and negotiating with them. You know, we can talk about um, uh, the reconciliation process, if you want. I'm not the best expert on it, but I probably know more than, than many. So I'm happy to discuss that if you want. I'm going to put that to the side. Just know that their counterproposal is fundamentally different. The 
Biden administration is saying it, they want to spend at least $2.3 trillion, or sorry, the high end is $2.3 trillion. The president's gone down as low as even about $1 trillion, but in new spending still. The Republicans are actually stacking their spending. They're trying to count the current expected spending levels too. So that's why you can see they're at least $750 billion apart. That's not a misprint. That's the real number. I mean, it, it's just the, the numbers moving around here are nuts. So that's the, hence the kind of second point on the funding does not exceed the baseline. The Republicans are interested in workforce and R&D issues. They don't want to invest nearly as much in it, and they are not nearly as interested in things like weatherization and other kind of real estate related elements. And of course, as you'd expect for Republican politics, um, they downplay the climate elements. Now, this is downplay. I, I kind of looked for the right word here. It is. I don't know if downplay is perfect, but it's not dismissed outright. It's not that you don't believe necessarily in the, the climate science, but they have to play their cards very differently in a kind of political setting. And, and again, we can unpack that a little bit if you want to. But what you're seeing play out, of course, in public is this kind of negotiation between these sides who all want to invest in physical capital systems. Again, transport, water, energy, broadband. They like all four. They disagree a little bit on how much. There's a compromise there. The question is are they, how much do the Democrats want to stick with R&D and workforce programs in particular? And how much are they able to thread the needle effectively on reconciliation um, with all of its intended kind of challenges um, uh, in terms of legislative maneuvers? So um, that's kind of the state of play. Talked a lot about kind of four big macro forces. The, the current debate is kind of trying to address them. Um, which is great. It's a sign. And it, it, look, there's really good leadership in Washington, and certainly on infrastructure issues that I focus on, on both sides of the aisle and folks who aren't even aligned with any side of the aisle. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff happening. But even within the realm of that debate, infrastructure works on generational cycles, kind of like to the answer to Chris's question, right? Thinking about like the Hoover Dam still in existence, right? From, from that was built during the New Deal. Um, the Golden Gate Bridge, which some people think was built with the New Deal, is actually even older than the New Deal. Um, so how can we um, start to address some even bigger long-term questions that will still be looming? Number one for me is how are we gonna manage the pain of climate change? So obviously you can think about what happened in Flint, which by the way, that was a fiscal crisis before it was a water crisis. And what I mean by that was the town of Flint was, was so broke that they no longer could purchase cleaner water from the Detroit River, which they knew did not have the same contaminants that would effectively cause the lead pipes going into housing in Flint um, to shed its lead, right? They switched to the Flint River, which of course is, is in Flint, and they knew it had the contaminants in it, and they knew what would happen, but it was cheaper. So it was actually a fiscal crisis created a water crisis, which of course created a a actual criminal case against not just the leaders in Flint, but also, as you all know, at the state level, also caused a uh, massive, massive bailout from Washington because Washington does not have direct capital programs that invest in lead water pipe removal, right? To be clear, the Flint River's water is clean to drink. It's just that it has contaminants in it. Again, as a non-hydrologist, I don't know exactly what I'm saying. The, but those contaminants in the water will cause the lead pipes, right, to shed their lead. And now all of a sudden the water inside one's home is dirty. So that's just one example. We know you've been probably seeing a little bit about this concept of climate disclosures. Um, how do companies start to expose what kind of um, assets they own, how they maybe are uh, situated well in a climate uh, sensitive moment. And of course, you know, the picture of the firefighters in California recently and just what that means going forward when there's more super storms. This is gonna be painful, right? There, there's no like, you know, Americans don't like this kind of stuff too, which is by the way, this is why I think the storytelling is so hard here. And you see things like the New York Times making an over commitment to say, look, we are just going to cover climate change. You may not want to click on it. They're, they're often not stories with a silver, uh, like a silver lining to them, right? But if we don't force ourselves to talk about this, we're never gonna get serious about solving it. And we have got to solve this. 
again, back, think back to that disaster chart I showed you, right? It is getting much, much worse. And it is costing us a fortune, right? So someone's going to have to pay here. And I'll give you an example, one final one on how we manage the pain. There is a debate happening right now in the Senate on changing the flood insurance program, because actually all of us as Americans actually pay for the flood insurance or, or kind of backstop most of the flood insurance uh, for certain kinds of elements. Um, it's not what you buy in the market, but we're actually the fast backstop, the national NFIP it's called. There is certain senators because of their membership on the left that are trying to block these changes because they don't want their constituents to pay more for what a change of climate is. You can look it up, you will find everything that you need to hear. I don't wanna say the certain names and words, um, but the point is, this is going to be painful for everyone. There's no like, there's no easy out here just to say because you believe in climate change, let's say. And this is a huge component of how we're going to have to address it. You know, what we have done in the US that you see on the, the two pictures on the left, we have built a whole lot of that on the top. And again, I grew up in Florida. This is what where I kind of grew up looked like. And because we've built a whole lot of that, we've gotten a whole lot of the bottom picture, which is endless traffic. And of course, you can kind of feel the smog in that picture too. So we've gotten huge environmental impacts. It's caused really uncomfortable commutes. I don't know if any of you are living in, in DC or driving around, but just brutal transportation uh, on the roads during rush hours, pre-pandemic, of course, and it's starting to come back. And it's caused, because the distances are so far from one another, and this is something we've studied, the average trip in the United States is now 10 miles. Think about that for a second. The average trip to do anything is 10 miles. Now that's heavily distorted by commuting behavior. Many of who people commute 25 miles, let's say to work, I mean, really far distances. Um, and it has absolutely distorted um, our environmental, our social fabric, um, and it's actually not economically efficient. So, you know, the picture on the right kind of tends to get associated with uh, with the, let's call it like, it's not the political left, it's kind of more of like an urbanist uh, elite. And I, I think it couldn't be further from the truth. There's a reason our peers in Europe who share most of our common traits and our peers in Eastern Asia build neighborhoods like this because it's more efficient, again, economically speaking, it requires a lot less infrastructure, so it's cheaper. Second, it's socially inclusive. It actually brings people closer together. It, creates less um, uh, of barriers to opportunity. And third, maybe most important, it is by far more environmentally efficient. So how do we get more neighborhoods in America looking like the one on the right versus the ones on the left? And that's gonna mean we've got two choices. Number one, we're gonna need to make developing land more expensive, which just feels like it flies in the face of American values. Even more importantly, we're gonna have to make driving Expensive, which is most likely the way that we're going to have to get after this. And that is going to be really hard for people to hear. Third, what's it going to take to digitalize the full built environment? You all probably read a lot of stories about this and they're all awesome. Like they can be really exciting. You know, this is kind of techno utopia coming to life. Of course, it will never be utopian, but you get my point. Here's just some examples of what we've got to do in the built environment to tap into all the opportunity that digital services and digital uh, physical technologies make possible. Again, this is why getting broadband networks, wireline into homes, wireless devices in every person's hands are so important, right? So we can all tap into this the same way that we all know how to flip on a light switch and basically every building um, uh, you know, has electricity run into it because that's when you really tap into the full benefits. Fourth, how do we make infrastructure a preferred career choice? This story is just not told enough and what's fascinating about it, it really does connect to, if any of you work on education issues, right? Um, it's, uh, it's deeply connected there. It's also, of course, broader kind of macro labor market stories. Um, infrastructure jobs pay really well, especially at the quote unquote lower end of the spectrum. So what that means is an entry level job in infrastructure pays significantly more than let's say an entry level job in food retail. So we actually want to get more people in these jobs. They're also STEM uh, intensive and they don't require four or even two year degrees. So how can we actually help kids? Probably many of us were different, you know, that when we were in, in high school, there was no, no push to say, hey, you, should, you can go to trade school, right? You know, and you don't even need to go, uh, you and your parents don't need to take on any debt, let's say, right? For, for, for college education. These people actually get trained on the job for free. So 
a huge opportunity for the US labor market. And then this is my final slide. Um, how do we build public trust, right? I don't know if you've ever seen this, this chart from Gallup. Um, you know, I think sometimes we, we act like we've been in this kind of, you know, no one trusts the federal government moment for decades and decades, but it actually is not that long, right? Um, it's really at the turn of the century when things started to go sour. Interestingly, and again, I work for the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings, so we're focused on local issues, but you can see people really do trust their local government, uh, government officials more. And because infrastructure is so often planned and even paid for locally, that's a huge opportunity. So how can we kind of make sure that, you know, federal, state, and local work together here on these issues? Um, so anyways, that's all I've got. Um, thanks for sitting through all that. Um, and Joey, I can see your hand up. I'm, I'm happy to take questions, um, starting with you, and hopefully we can fill the rest of the time we got. Okay, so we have time for questions. Anybody um, want to get started? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll get ahead. Um, Thanks, that was a really good presentation. I appreciate it. I had a, uh, going back to the baseline spending and how uh, we as reporters have been spending that in the uh, context of the American Jobs Plan. Do you think it's been kind of misleading how, uh, you know, Republicans have been throwing out, you know, the most recently the $928 billion figure, but really that's $257 billion in, in spending over baseline. Um, and, you know, looking at the last Republican proposal, that 257 billion in new spending plus, I guess, 50 billion added uh, in negotiations last Friday. Historically, would that even be a real sub substantial increase over the spending? You went over that a little bit, but but in terms of what Republicans are wanting right now, uh, um, you, you know, where does that kind of rank in terms of the last? Uh, century of, of infrastructure spending. And just going back to the first part of the question, what is your, rec you know, how do you think that it should be reported in terms of, of new spending over uh, baseline in this, uh, as we report on this issue? Yeah, it's, it's, first of all, it's a great question, Joey. It's really, really hard um, to, to get the, that Republican part and why you hopefully heard that tone in my, my comments. The Republican amount is also significant. So even yeah. though it's only you know, anywhere from 250, to, we're not getting a straight story, right? This is part of the problem. Like it's, <laughs> these are like, I don't even know if negotiation is the right term because the president doesn't really have a vote. And yeah. I don't know if anyone's saying he's gonna, I just don't see Biden vetoing any bill that comes out of, you know, conference committee, if let's say it's traditional or reconciliation from the Senate, right? Like mm -hmm. I just don't see him vetoing it. So in which case, I don't know, I don't know exactly who the Republicans are negotiating with through the, through the presidential bit when we've seen, um, bills come out, right? The House just introduced their bill last week on surface transport. The Senate EPW, the Environment and Public Works, they actually already passed their bill out of committee. The water bill is already done in the Senate. Like there is real movement here. And so it sounds like the Republican commitment, let's say it's 250 billion extra over five years. That extra 50 billion, as you saw in that chart, that's significant. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's not to New Deal levels, but it's big. And if that's, Knowing in DC negotiation terms, that probably means we're going to get closer to maybe a hundred billion in extra new spending per year, and it might even be more than that. So, just to put in, in some numbers on the table for you all, there's pretty universal interest in certainly lead water pipe removal because we don't have direct grant programs in water. That alone could be, let's say, ten to twenty billion dollars. Then you've got broadband, which is going to be anywhere from sixty to hundred billion. And then everyone loves spending more on roads and bridges, no matter what, because right, that's ribbon cuttings for uh, elected officials. Um, so let's say you've got an extra 50 plus billion there, right? You could very quickly in five years add up to right over hundred billion in new spending. And I think the Republicans will sign on to that. Um, the workforce programs they agree with too, and it, it's the R&D is probably, it's the quote unquote cylindras, right? Which ironically enough, it's actually, that's one of the biggest ROI programs from the 2009 stimulus was the same R&D programs that gave way to Solyndra, right? Famously, as some of you have probably heard, Tesla got the same grants. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, that's what happens when you do R&D, take risks. And we'll see where the Republicans land on that one. But yeah, I think it's going to be significant. I think it's been, I think the, I think the media has been covering it as well as they can. The president is negotiating in public, so you have to cover it. But it just, and I, I, I defer to you all. I mean, there's just a civics challenge here, right? Because the president doesn't have a vote on the Hill. He has a veto. But if he's not threatening the veto, then I don't know. I don't know exactly. I don't know how you cover it differently. 
Well, I guess I, so. The White House was referring to when they put out the dollar figures. You know, there, there was 1.7 trillion, and now it seems like one point uh, one trillion in new spending. They're talking about new funds, but the Republicans, their dollar figures they're using is includes baseline spending, and, and, and the baseline money. What that's all been approved from past pack from past legislation, or what exactly are they including in their tally there? Yeah, so they are including. Um, it's the it's the current spending levels from the surface transportation bill, which is currently called the FAST Act, the um, Water Resources Development Act, WERDA, which goes by slightly different acronyms, um, and that's pretty much it. And then plus other little budgetary items like you know there's still a Tennessee Valley like authority right that has power right. under its portfolio and things, and the Pacific Northwest is actually under federal public power. Um, but yeah, that's all. That's what it is. So it's okay. That's what I thought. Historic budget tables. Yeah. I'm Joey Garrison, USA Today, by the way. Yeah, great to meet you, Joey. Let's introduce myself. Yeah, thanks. yeah no, thanks. I'm just now seeing the clock. I'm sorry, I went so long. Uh, I, I had no idea, Chris, I apologize. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So uh, other questions? So tell me, uh, Eddie, tell me a little bit about that last chart you were showing the the difference in trust between local gov local politicians and federal politicians. I mean, what can be, you know, is it possible to play off that to get more support for the for the program? And, and what can local politicians do to help help push through a infrastructure plan that'll end up coming back to their home states? Yeah, you know, what we tend to think in the infrastructure arena is that it's been really easy for mayors and governors to sell infrastructure packages, relatively speaking. We've seen huge approval rates for them, which we can measure by these things called ballot measures that some of you are probably familiar with. It's a whole kind of line. There's actually some great reporting on them too, um, where people go to the ballot and they say, right, do you want this new project, right? Like a transit expansion in LA or in Atlanta. Um, and they pass at three quarter clips, right? So, and then often the ones that fail come back and pass later once they make some changes. The problem is for federal leaders is local leaders can always say, this is what you're going to get for it, right? Like this exact project. It's hard for a federal leader to say what they're going to get. By the way, this is a big reason why both sides of the aisle wanted to bring your arms back. It's because it allows them to bring at least a big project back home to say, folks, hey, this is what we're going to get if, when I vote for this infrastructure bill. Um, overall, what I think it, the whole chart tells us is that the more you can listen to what the American people want, chances are the more they're going to support um, what's going on. And that's why this infrastructure debate this, this summer now through the fall is really important. Because uh, now the American people, that's why back to the, the Biden administration, they won the day on media. But right, we all know that's just like one step of many in the process. People are now talking about this. So if they fail to deliver, right, it's just going to impact that chart even more. And that's what we always talk about with mayors and, and local officials. They have to deliver. They don't have a choice to fail. You can't not plow the snow. So I think this is there's real pressure on legislators right now to get some kind of bill over the finish line. Um, and I think both sides probably feel that, frankly. Okay, we have time for like one more question. Does anybody anybody have one? Uh, Arjun. Sorry, I don't have the raise hand feature, so give a thumbs up. Um, Hey, I'm Arjun. I'm from the Washington Post. And so I guess my question is more of just a, um, from your perspective, one thing that I've noticed in terms of federal policy is that there's a lot of deference given towards the automobile industry, particularly their interest in terms of job creators. But I, you know, growing up in California, I know that car culture is a very dominant thing and that many times car culture comes into conflict with local policies in terms of transportation. But have you noticed in just your own research, is there kind of this deference towards the automobile industry getting in the way of more ambitious kind of large scale, high speed rail, big massive transportation projects on the federal level? Because it seems like on the local level, there's traditionally, except for some governors maybe, there's usually a push to get more investment in these big projects, but then on the federal level, you don't really see as much discussion. Yeah, no, it's a, gr a great prompt, Arjun. I'll try to be quick. That that one can demand a whole separate like half hour conversation, right? Um, the the short of it is, yes, 
it's car culture is deep in there. And frankly, I think you see it, you just saw it with when the president was at the Ford facility driving their electric F-150. Um, we deeply connect car culture to manufacturing culture and to opportunity culture, meaning like we are so many decades into suburbanization, again, California, like Florida, like we kind of understand this, like you're, it starts to become, you. how do you live in most communities without a car, right? So there's this understanding, and it's not wrong, right? Like, hey, if we're going to solve the climate crisis, we can't get rid of cars, right? Because people have to get around to these far distances. So let's electrify the fleet. Um, and, you know, we, we just put out some work on this that like, hey, you actually can't hit your long-term climate goals if you keep having people drive around, whether it's just stormwater uh, elements or frankly, all the nastiness that goes into building electric cars. So um, yes, it's deeply tied at the federal level. I don't know what it's going to cause to break it. My, my two cents really quick on this is that's why the how much we pay to drive really matters. Our common language in the United States, I, I personally believe this in like colloquial terms, it's not English, right? It's, it's money. Like money talks in a market economy like ours in, in a good way. And right now driving is way, way too cheap relative to its environmental and other impacts. So we need to just charge people the right price to drive. And this is why you see congestion pricing and other features, a big topic of conversation, even in Southern and Northern California to say nothing in New York and Seattle, and other communities. So um, it really is something to watch over the next few years um, over how we handle it. Because if, if we pay different amounts to get around, I think people will start acting differently. And then all of a sudden you can see markets um, moving and locked up with it. Okay. And with that, we need to draw this session to a close. Um, AD, I want to thank you very much for the great background. Uh, folks, he's, uh, AD is very accessible and very helpful. So don't hesitate to reach out to him as you're doing stories on the on the jobs plan as it's working through its way through the hill. So AD, I wanna thank you again very much for your time.